Uh, thanks so much for being here, Bob. Uh, watching you, that video, I think my first thought is I, I messed up. I picked the totally wrong profession. That looks way more fun than pulling your hair out trying to write a book or analyze technology. So can you tell us Come how? Come on over. <laughs> Come on over. We'll put you to work. I have some of my colleagues here. They'll, they'll probably agree we need help. So. Come on over. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into it? How did you grow up wanting to be an Imagineer? Did you come in from the creative side or the more architectural side? Well, I should probably say that that, that video, which, is, which depicts Walt Disney Imagineering, um, uh, we are the, the design group that was really founded by Walt Disney himself. He wanted, a, um, he wanted a place that could design Disneyland. He had this idea for Disneyland and um, he couldn't really find an existing industry to support it, so he, he built up uh, Imagineering, and it was a combination of engineering, of course, technical people, it still is, um, with people that come from animation, from filmmaking, from writing, from a whole variety of, of disciplines necessary to put those kinds of projects together. And today, even more so with the complexity of these jobs having just you know, huge numbers of disciplines that support it. But, but I didn't know about Imagineering. Um, I was a person interested in theater and architecture, and I just literally happened to, to find out about it at the right time when I was coming out of college. So I, I lucked out, and uh, it's been a great uh, experience being a part of so many international projects and, and U.S. projects. Right. And early in your time with Disney, you were put, put to work uh, as part of a very unique project putting together Tokyo Disneyland. And, you mentioned that the team that was sent over there was made up of three kinds of people, the fired, the retired, and the recently hired. That's exactly which, right. Which one of those were you, and what was it like working with <laughs> Well, them? I was recently hired. Uh, so um, it was, and there I am, uh, as a very young guy. Um, but Tokyo was done, the agreement had been made to build Tokyo Disneyland while Disney was deeply engaged in building Epcot at Walt Disney World. And literally, the company had all of its money and all of its talent available just completely overcommitted in Orlando. So the decision was made that if, if the people in Tokyo wanted to build a park with us, we would, build a, we would send a few people over, and then they would have to provide all the rest of the designers and artists and all that. And so for the first time, Disney had to learn how to not only go to a foreign country that they didn't know, um, but how to find, aggregate enough talent to build one of our parks without having the backbone of, of Disney there. And so that comment was that my old boss who hired me basically said, I'm gonna go get all these guys that retired and bring them back. <laughs> and, and if they were fired, I'll even bring them back. And then I'll take a bunch of young talent out of school and we'll send that small group over there and I think it was such a great start for me because my whole reference point uh, for Disney has been formed by knowing that if you're open, if you're open to it, you can go to a, a, another place like Tokyo and you can find out that there's amazing talent there, but you, you can't be culturally arrogant, you can't assume that Disney's always right, uh, you have to be open to that talent, and if you really engage and have that kind of partnership, which is so much about what this organization is about, you can really create something special that feels like it totally belongs to Disney, but it all, in this case, totally belongs to, to Tokyo also. And a testament to that, um, when they had the terrible earthquake um, and, and uh, it took a long time for the, for the country to recover, from that earthquake and Tokyo Disneyland out of, was not damaged, but it was out of respect for the, what was happening in the country. They closed for quite a bit of time for the first time. And when it reopened, it was as if it was a message that the country was gonna heal. And I think it was a message of optimism. And, it, and for us, that meant that it's truly owned by the audience there and it's really theirs. And, and nothing could be better for a designer of parks than to feel like the audience owns it. So there you were describing some high-level lessons that seem like they apply sort of everywhere at all times about cultural sensitivity, not being arrogant. Were there any lessons that you took away from that experience that you felt were more maybe Tokyo-specific or Japan-specific? Or do you feel like it really is kind of a portable model 
as long as you have that baseline sort of posture towards the work? I think that, that uh, um, Tokyo Disneyland has been a great experience because we've had a great partner, uh, Oriental Land Company, from the beginning. And one of the things we had with them from the beginning was a desire for quality. And that's such an important part of what Disney is about, is it has to be quality, everything about it. And OLC's always been that way, and so we share that ethic. And they've always wanted to do the best, bring the best to Japan, and so that relationship's been very uh, you know, conducive for both of us. Um, I think specifically in, in Japan, we found um, incredible technical resources uh, in terms of engineering and design, uh, incredible contractors uh, who, were, who were very focused on, on quality of construction. And so um, in some ways, you get used to that, and then you say, okay, we're going to go somewhere else, you may not find the same. You may, the strengths may be different. So you have to be careful to say, because I'm an expert in Tokyo, that makes me an expert in Paris or someplace else. You know, so you have, to each, you, have to, you have to enter each culture anew with, with a, a fresh opening, open mind, and bring in experts who can be a part of, of educating you as to how you should work there. And I guess that was directly applicable about, what, 25 years later when you're sort of take the lead in the Shanghai Disneyland project. And could you kind of take us through that process? At this point, you are no longer recently hired. You have not yet been fired or retired. So what was it like coming, right. into, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> coming into the Shanghai project in, in some ways a much stronger position, but also facing yeah. entirely uh, any kind of engagement with China on this scale is incredibly complex. Can you just maybe take us through that process of what some challenges were? Well, I think you have to put yourself in the, in the mindset of a, a person who has, uh, at that time, a pretty strong history with Disney, is a designer, has grown up with Disneyland, because I grew up in Southern California, has seen many Disneylands go up, and your boss comes in and says, would you like to lead the design of Shanghai Disneyland? it's a big deal because we don't build these very often, right? So, and the opportunity to, just to do one from the ground up with new ideas in it is amazing. But then if you say, and you're gonna do it in Shanghai, an amazing city, international city, you know, powerhouse economically, all those, it was a huge, just, you know, golden ticket really to be able to have that. Um, but the first thing we did, like we've done all of our projects is to say, you know, we don't have very much knowledge about, about Shanghai. And so we reached out, by that time we knew this is the only way to do it, so we reached out to both um, consultants and um, supporting players who could tell us more about the construction industry, about the creative talents. That's how I met Janet, actually, because she was an advisor to us. We needed people who could write in in native uh, Mandarin, not you know, taking the English script and trying to adapt it or translated it. We needed more native storytelling. We needed artists who understood, um, who, artists who could understand Disney, but also could adapt it to a, the sensibilities of, of, the, of the culture in Shanghai. So, so that was a exciting process. And I'd say in the early days, it was difficult because I think you kind of say, oh, well, everybody's going to want to work for Disney. And you find out, actually, people got jobs. They're not that interested. You, know, you can't just automatically assume it. And uh, particularly in the live entertainment area, great students that were coming out of music universities or acting or other dance performance um, were a little suspect. Do I really want to go work in a theme park? You know, is that it? But once you start to, or in, I would say sculptors, other artists are the same way, but once the dam starts to break, and you get a few from this school and a few from this school, or a few from this studio or this company, word got around, and you suddenly have a flood of amazing talent that said, oh, this is okay. <laughs> this is going to be a good thing. We could be a part of it. And then you have the real magic that happens, which is that you have someone from from Disney there, who maybe has worked many years at Disney, who has a vision of something. You have a new person there 
who maybe has, doesn't have the Disney background, but they're an amazing sculptor, an amazing artist, colorist, architect. And that's where that magic really becomes, it becomes something else. It isn't, it isn't all Disney. And it was, it was at the groundbreaking, and we're all out there uh, on this big piece of land, and it's muddy and raining, and you know, we're ready to start. It's a daunting process. And uh, Bob Iger came in for the groundbreaking, and as part of his speech for the groundbreaking, he coined this phrase, authentically Disney and distinctly Chinese. And he actually came up with the phrase there. It wasn't <laughs> written ahead of time. But it became a, a guide point for us that we said, whether it's food or color or how the cast is trained or the language is used, all those things together, we want you to know you could, you could not be anywhere else except Disney. It's absolutely authentic. But you also could not be anywhere else except here in Shanghai. It's an absolutely distinct. It's not a copy of another park from someplace else. It's distinctively Chinese. And that was, that was challenging. Um, we had a very, we had a respect, diverse points of view on the creative team. But in the end, I think we're all very proud to, to have, have launched the project that way. Yeah, that's, I think it, the, the success of that is kind of really evident when you get there. I, I visited the park in oh, good. research for my book. And while I was there, I kind of got this question spinning in my head because a little Chinese kid came up to me and he put it in and said, why Warren, foreigner? Um, <laughs> you know, normal, normal proclamation. Right. But it got me thinking, to this kid, is Mickey Mouse an American? Is Mickey Mouse a foreigner? Is Mickey Mouse Chinese? And so I, I sent a message to my, to my friend who's a school teacher in central China just asking her, you know, ask all your students, is, is Mickey Mouse American or is Mickey Mouse Chinese? She sent me videos of all their responses. And, you know, these are kids who are maybe five, five through ten years old. And it really kind of left them kind of scratching their heads. Very few of them were like, that's an American. Some of yeah. them said, mm, he's like American, but now he's kind of Chinese, or he's both Chinese and he's American, he's for the world, right. all this kind of stuff, but it really, there's been a certain blending of elements in their mind where this doesn't kind of fall along right. national boundaries in the same way. Well, I love this photo because um, this was just before the opening, and all those people there are what we call the cast, the cast members, because we consider it a show every day, but all those people came together to do this project, and, and by far the, the overwhelming uh, number there are all from the region around Shanghai. So these are new Disney cast members who are, who are there every day meeting guests who are, you know, uh, absolutely Chinese. But, but to your point, we did, we did a number of focus groups, and I found this was one of the most resonant points I found, which was we were in one of them, and we were showing some some things that I would say were kind of Americana-ish. There's a certain amount of Disney kind of Americana feeling stuff. And one of the people in the focus group, a father of a child that was there, said, Disney does not belong to America. Disney belongs to the world. And I always remembered that, and I, and I believe that, that, that we belong to the world, and so we don't need to come into a new place with a giant American flag on our we have to come as Disney, as storytellers, as artists, as people who, who want to engage uh, people to have a place to go that's safe with their families. All the original things that Walt wanted mm -hmm. seem to be things that anybody wants, right? We want to take our kids and we want to go out and have a fun, exciting experience or we want to be with our friends and, and feel like we're immersed mm -hmm. in a, a, a kind of our own story. I think that translates across many cultures, that basic uh, need translates. And talking about the um, doing a focus group and kind of getting that feedback, it made me think of the previous panel where they're talking about artificial and this kind of iterative storytelling. And while Disney's uh, film content isn't iterative in that way, a theme park kind of is in that it's constantly being updated and added to and tweaked to kind of meet mm -hmm. with uh, meet the users where they are, meet what they want. What would you say are maybe some lessons that you've learned since the opening? Uh, either new projects that are being added on or tweaks that hadn't been all preconceived before it opened up. Right. Uh, I think when you think about designing a park, and by the way, we design the parks, but we also do hotels and resorts and, and cruise ships, but specifically when you design a park, 
and you think back to the way Walt Disney did it originally and what, what founded Disney, is it's like you're putting the guest into their own story. So we're not telling them a story, we're putting them into a story, and they experience it. I always say that the best park designs are if you could take all the signs out and people could still get around because you're drawn from place to place, you're drawn from story to story, and you want to go into a place like Adventure, Adventure, Adventure Isle or Tomorrowland or whatever, and you want to know that the story is complete. You're in, you're in that story and everything is kind of consistent with that. And when you're inside Disneyland, you don't want to look out and see the modern world right up to the edge of it, right? Because your whole day there is kind of your story and you're you know, out of it. So I think we think of it as, as environmental storytelling or immersive storytelling. We want you to be the star. It's your point of view. You're the camera or you're the star. And we plan, we mock up, we do lots of things. But I would say you don't really know until guests come in. You know, we're professionals, we know a lot. But a, a few weeks ago I was in, I was in Orlando um, and we got up and went to the park at 4 a.m., which we always do, um, when it opened, when we opened something. So we were opening Star Wars Galaxy's Edge and we had to be there by 4 o'clock in the morning because guests were already lined up at about midnight, so they were going to open it at four so they could sneak them in. And when you see them coming in for the first time, that's an incredibly emotional moment, because I'm, I'm sure it's like what a film director, when they first see their film with an audience, right? You see them coming in, you see the faces, you see the way they feel. That's the first time you really know if they're going to get this or not. And then over time, in the case of Shanghai, over time, we learned from the audience, we learned the mix of, you know, food experiences. Um, we had surprises. You know, this really worked. This doesn't seem to have resonated. Uh, we had no idea that, that turkey legs, which are an incredibly American, you know, thing, I think, <laughs> giant <laughs> turkey legs, we never expected them to sell so well in Shanghai. Just never expected it. And they're, you know, bought every turkey leg by nine o'clock in the morning. Couldn't, you know, couldn't stock them. Had to go source turkey legs in Poland or something to get more, <laughs> get enough turkey legs. You learn that when the audience finally gets in there. You learn if, if they get the storyline of a, of a show or a, um, a ride, or if you need to tell them more ahead of time so that they're not trying to figure it out, they can, they can see that. And most important, when you're in a dynamic international city like Shanghai, you have to be constantly refreshing. And refreshing, that means new live entertainment, new attractions, um, new things for people to do. Uh, and, and that aligns directly with Disney being a big IP creator because then you could say, okay, these, these films, these animated films, live action um, have come out and, the, and we can see where they've resonated with the, with the audience of the market we're talking about and say, we need to develop an attraction with that, that focus. And so um, we're constantly refreshing and adding new things. Maybe going back just a little bit to sort of the process of creation and working with the Chinese team, you mentioned that in Japan, you found a specific strength was on the technical side, the attention to detail, uh, the construction, the contractors. Uh, in no way endorsing this viewpoint, but there are some who would think that Chinese technical side is not always as attention to detail focused as the Japanese side of that. What were some either unique strengths or unique challenges in, that you encountered when working with Chinese creators on this side of it? I think that, um, yeah, as I said, each country is kind of different. And, and I think that um, it took us, even if you go back to Japan, even though the contractors were technically really sophisticated, and there's kind of a sense of refinement in the contracting community. Um, they had never built Western architecture. You know, we're talking about 40 years ago. We're not talking about now. Obviously, Japan is much more international in, in, in building today, but they had not built Western architecture. And so you had to really explain what that cornice was or what a double-hung hung window was. Or I mean, these are, these are things that not, not because they didn't know it because they've never known it. They've never had to build that way. Um, 
I think that in China, we were, we were really encouraged by Bob Iger to be incredibly ambitious. And so we went into a market that didn't know us and still did the most aggressive design we could do. We built the biggest castle ever built, tallest, widest, most in it. Um, we decided not to do a lot of traditional things like we have a space mountain at Disneyland. We decided we wanted to do Tron, which is totally different. You ride on a bike. It's a completely new ride system. And something like Pirates, um, Pirates had existed um, in, in the Pirates franchise that existed in, in China for a long time, but not as a ride. We know it as a ride if you live in Southern California. They knew it as a movie series, and those movies are operatic. Those are huge scale. So the Pirates in China was huge, you know, needed a new kind of ride system, new, new visuals, all that. So I think in, in China we were simultaneously working with contractors for the first time, and we were trying to build the biggest, craziest thing we'd ever built before. So uh, a lot of us took a deep breath of relief when we opened, like we did it. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't the easiest thing to, to get done. Right. But we're, you know, we, not only did we do it, but we could stand there with our, our Chinese colleagues and say we all did it together. And the next projects we do, um, which, many of which we're working on now, will be that much better because now we understand each other, we know how to work together, and, we, and we've calibrated our expectations to each other. Right. And something just feels very, uh, very China, very Shanghai about building the biggest castle and kind of that scale of ambition right. is very China 2010 in some ways or 2010 through the present day. Yeah, yeah, we didn't, uh, um, I wanted to get feedback uh, uh, Doris Woodward's out here, has been part of the team from the beginning, uh, and uh, she and I have similar lengths of time at Disney, but we pulled, we pulled castles, pictures of castles from around the world, and we covered walls with them. Disney castles and, and, and just castles from around the world. And then we brought our, our Chinese advisors in, and we gave them all little dots to stick on them because we were trying to get a sense of, to their eye, what says castle. And, and it was very telling to kind of see certain castles that were covered with dots and then certain that you know, didn't, didn't get played. Um, but the one thing that they all agreed was, it has to be the biggest. <laughs> and so um, we went to a lot of effort to make sure it was the biggest. Right. And, I mean, part of your portfolio, even beyond the theme park specifically, is stuff like cruises, hotels, global merchandise, and stuff like that. And those are also areas where there's an increasingly globally diverse uh, customer base, an yes. audience base. And in, across maybe some of those other portfolios, whether it's the cruises or the merchandise or hotels, is there a similar effort to uh, adapt those to this increasingly diverse user base in the sense of uh, making the hotels more friendly to certain Chinese yeah. or broader Asian customs or cruises, anything like that? Yeah, I think that, that uh, we're, we're undergoing a, a, a expansion on a number of our properties right now, including in Paris. Um, and we know the audience much better around Europe than we ever did before. So um, not only do we have a better sense of the audience, but we have more designers and artists who are from that area of Europe who lead these projects. So, so our company has become more global as the projects have become more global. But cruise specifically, we are building, we're building new cruise ships right now, and we build them at, at an incredibly talented shipyard in Germany. And they don't know Disney, but they know how to build ships. We know Disney, but we don't know how to build ships. So you put those two together, and they're incredibly talented at making sure that, you know, we don't, we don't know how to make it float, right? <laughs> they do that. But, but they also know how to make these gigantic structures and put them together in the water and, and do all of that. And then our job is to make it Disney. And so that's a very similar collaboration. We have an you know, incredible shipyard, and, and, and they help us do something we've never done before. And, um, you know, we, we, we do that in many places. It's that combination. I don't think we would be successful in the cruise business, and we do cruises all over the world now. We do them in 
and Europe, and we, we do them throughout the Bahamas, and we go to Alaska, and, and that's going to get larger. As we know, you know, the cruise ship business is going to launch more and more in, in Asia, too. Um, I don't think we would be successful in the cruise business if we didn't have incredible ship fabricators who have collaborated with us in the same way that people have around the world building parks. So uh, with just a couple minutes left here, if you were today throwing together that team to build uh, you know, Rio Disneyland or Mumbai Disneyland and you had your team of uh, fired, retired, and recently <laughs> hired, what would you say to the recently hired version of you about doing this at this point in time? I mean, you were doing it in the 1980s or getting started in the 1980s when it was a much different, uh, just the global interconnectivity at that time was at a different level. What kind of advice would you give to a young person who's entering this field and looking mm -hmm. to create these kind of global entertainment projects looking 10, 20, 30 years forward? I think the, the big one is, for me is that we live in a world of incredibly diverse talent. And, and if you can figure out how to run an inclusive design company that is able to highly leverage the talents that come from around the world and, and, uh, and not feel like in order for me to work with somebody, they have to be local or have to know them or have known them for years. But if you can bring new talent in. And, and when I started, um, you, you, you know, we had, a, we had a Panifax machine. <laughs> we had one Panifax machine. Now we can work with people around the world and we can, we can you know, do blue jeans and, you know, talk to them and, and speak all over. We can send models back and forth. We can send 3D printed elements back and forth. So now you have all the advantage of you can communicate globally. And so there's no reason not to be reaching out and, and, and having an incredibly inclusive design team. I remember uh, one time somebody in, uh, in our office in Shanghai said to me, well, you know, we were gonna use them, but they don't speak English. And I said, we don't speak Mandarin. <laughs> that we're the ones that are handicapped in the language. We're in China, we don't speak Mandarin. There, you know, so it, it's a mind shift that I think you have to make. But once you do it, you're open to a tremendous you know, amount of talent and ideas that, that the world provides. Great. I think that's a great place to end it. So everyone join me in thanking Bob for his work and for being here. Thank you, Mark.